island of Sodor is surrounded by beautiful blue sea. It has fields of green and sandy yellow beaches. There are rivers, streams, and lots of trees where the birds sing. There are windmills and a coal mine, and docks where visitors to the island arrive. The island also has lots and lots of railway lines. Who's that puffing down the track? It's Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the island of Sodor. At harvest time, the air is filled with the smell of fresh fruit and vegetables. The engines happily deliver their loads to market. But one day, mist and rain swirl down Toby's line. Percy was delivering a load of fresh tomatoes. Suddenly, he felt a big bump. Bust my buffers! Percy cried. What was that? The guard put out the warning flags while Percy's driver inspected the tracks. The earth's crumbling, he said. We must tell Sir Topham Hatt, decided Percy. Percy puffed back as fast as he could. I've got important news. The tracks on Toby's line are wobbly. <sighs> Puffed Gordon. Old and wobbly, just like Toby. That's not news. Can't stop to listen to your silly chatter. Gordon never listens to me, muttered Percy. Next, he spoke to Sir Topham Hatt. Sir, sir. Not now, Percy. Thomas, you are to collect the prize bull. He's at the farm on Toby's line. Yes, sir. But those tracks are wobbly, cried Percy. They are safe enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. Bye, Percy. Nobody ever listens to me. Thomas was carefully chuffing through the rain. Soon, he had collected the farmer's bull and was on his way back. The rain had made the tracks more wobbly than ever. Suddenly, there was a deep rumbling sound. Thomas's driver applied the brakes, but it was too late. Cinders and ashes, cried Thomas. We're stuck. And they were. Late that night, Thomas still hadn't returned. Percy was worried. Thomas is in trouble, he said. Gordon and James took no notice. Worry wheels, huffed Gordon. Fussy funnel, said James. Please, Percy asked his driver, can we find Thomas? Right away, said his driver. Percy was nervous but his lamp shone brightly in the dark. The tracks creaked and wobbled, but Percy pressed on. Percy, cried Thomas. Thomas was very happy to see his friend. I'll have you out of there in no time, said Percy. Percy puffed, and pulled, and pulled, and puffed. And finally, Thomas and his driver were free. Oh, thank you, said Thomas. I'm glad to be useful, smiled Percy. It was dawn before the track was cleared. 
Then Percy and Thomas made their way back home. Thomas is here, whistled Percy. Percy saved the day, said Thomas. Mm, agreed the bull. I'm sorry, Percy, said Sir Topham Hatt. We must do a better job of listening to you in the future. Percy was pleased. Arthur loves working on the island of Sodor. He is new to the railway and is still learning his way around. One morning, he discovered the fishing village. The sun made the water sparkle, and the seagulls called across the harbor. This was Arthur's favorite place. That evening, Sir Topham Hatt came to the sheds. There's going to be a new line to the fishing village. I have to decide which engine shall run it. He paused impressively. Thomas and Percy looked away. They had enough work to do. Arthur hoped he would be chosen. Thomas, you will work on the new line. Yes, sir, said Thomas, but he really didn't like the smell of fish. Arthur was disappointed. Sir Topham Hatt sent him to haul coal to the steelworks. That evening, Thomas was at the washdown when Arthur puffed in. Do I smell a fishy engine? He teased. Yes, huffed Thomas. Silly fish, smelly new line. Arthur wished he could go to the fishing village instead of the steelworks. He'd be much happier than Thomas. The next morning, Thomas was still grumpy. The fishermen had caught lots of fish. Hurry up, said Thomas. I'm a busy engine. And a fussy one, too, said the fisherman. Just enjoy the fresh, salty smell of the fish. Pee you, puffed Thomas. Thomas steamed as fast as he could along the line. But there was trouble ahead. Some faulty points sent his freight cars one way and Thomas onto the old pier rail. Whoa! The troublesome trucks were delighted. He's falling in the water! <laughs> Luckily, Thomas wasn't hurt, and the fish freight cars stayed on the tracks. When Sir Topham Hatt heard the news, he checked his timetable. Arthur is the nearest engine. I'll send him right away. It was a hot day. The ice that was keeping the fish cold started to melt. I hope someone comes quickly, moaned Thomas. That fish will spoil soon. Arthur was surprised to see Thomas in the tidal pool. Are you all right, Thomas? No, but I'll be much better when you take these fish away. The breakdown van will be here soon, called Arthur's driver. Arthur knew he had to hurry. He raced along the line to the docks and arrived there just in time. Later, Arthur went to see Thomas at the fitter's yard. Thank you for helping me, said Thomas. Thank you, said Arthur. I wish I had the fishing village line all the time. Well, please tell Sir Topham Hatt, because I don't like fish. That evening, Sir Topham Hatt came to the sheds. I need an engine to go to the fishing village while Thomas is being repaired, he said. Any volunteers? Me! Arthur blurted out. And please, sir, may I run on that line all the time? Thomas doesn't like fish, but I do. Then the line is yours, said Sir Topham Hatt. Arthur was delighted. The next morning, he puffed into the fishing village right on time. The smell of fish was everywhere. 
but he was sure he had the most beautiful line on the island of Sodor. It was the end of a busy day. The engines had been working hard. They were feeling pleased and proud. Except Henry. He was feeling ill. What's the matter with you, Henry? Thomas asked. My boiler's grumbling. Maybe it's grumbling at you, teased Thomas. That's not funny, hissed Henry. You just don't care. But Emily saw that Henry was leaving a puddle of water behind. She was worried. The next morning, Sir Topham had arrived. Thomas, Percy, Henry, I want you to collect some freight cars and take them to the docks. Yes, sir, cried Thomas and Percy. Henry watched the engines puff away. He didn't feel well. Useful engines don't complain, Henry muttered. He was leaving water everywhere as he chuffed towards the coaling plant. When Emily saw this, she was more worried than ever. Then Thomas and Percy overtook Henry. Hurry up, Henry! Percy tooted. I can't go any faster, Henry chuffed miserably. You're just being lazy, teased Thomas. By the time Thomas and Percy reached the coaling plant, they had a naughty plan. Please, sir, said Thomas. Henry wants to take more freight cars. He is bigger, added Percy. The odd manager agreed. Meanwhile, Emily was talking to Sir Topham Hatt. I'm worried about Henry. Hmm, perhaps his tubes are leaking, replied Sir Topham Hatt. You'd better check. By the time Henry reached the coaling plant, Thomas and Percy had already left. Why did Thomas and Percy leave me so many freight cars, moaned Henry. They know I'm not feeling well. We'll still have to take them, said his driver. Henry chuffed and puffed and pulled his long line of freight cars. You can do it, Henry, encouraged his driver. But it was no use. Henry ground to a halt. Just then, Emily arrived. Are you all right, Henry? No, moaned Henry. I'm stuck. Henry's firemen uncoupled the heavy freight cars. Emily changed tracks and then hooked up to Henry. Oh, thank you, Emily, wished Henry. Emily and Henry puffed into the docks. Well done, Emily, said Sir Topham Hatt. Thank you, sir. Then he spoke to Henry. You were brave, Henry. You weren't well, but you still tried to pull the heavy freight cars. Thomas and Percy felt ashamed. We're sorry, Henry, said Thomas. We didn't think you were really sick, added Percy. Go back and collect Henry's freight cars, said Sir Topham Hatt sternly. Yes, sir, whispered Thomas. Soon, Henry was mended and back at work. You're looking so much better, said Emily. Well, they mended my tubes, but they didn't even look at my brakes, my gauges, my squeaky wheels. Emily smiled. All in good time, Henry. Poor Henry. Reneus and Scarloe work on the most beautiful line on the island of Sodor. 
They love to puff through the forests and over the rivers. An old bridge crosses one of the rivers. Some of its beams were rotten and had now been damaged by the storm. Skarloey chuffed happily along. He didn't see the broken rail until it was too late. He dangled dangerously above the water. Help! But Reneus soon pulled him to safety. A few days later, Sir Topham Hatt came to the sheds. The old bridge has been mended, but the workers' freight cars have been left there. Scarloe, I need you to collect them. Yes, sir, chuffed Scarloe. He didn't want to go on the bridge again. When Scarloe arrived, he saw the freight cars on the other side. He started to cross, but stopped. He looked down into the rushing water. Skarloey was scared. He remembered what had happened before. Come on, Skarloey, called his driver. The bridge is safe now. But Skarloey wouldn't cross the bridge. And he and his driver went home instead. We'll pick up the freight cars, said Reneus' driver. But if you don't cross the bridge soon, said Reneus, Sir Top of Hat will be cross. Now, Reneus had to take Skarloey's loads as well as his own. Each morning, he collected the freight cars and puffed across the bridge with his heavy load. Finally, Sir Topham Hat came to see Skarloey. If you won't cross the old bridge, you must stay here and shunt freight cars, he scolded. I can't have engines that won't do as they're told. Sorry, sir, said Skarloey sadly. The next morning, Reneus took Skarloey's heavy freight cars as usual. Then he puffed and heaved through the countryside towards the bridge. He puffed so hard that he ran out of water. Bother. The yard manager spread the news. Reneus has broken down. We must go help him, said Skarloey bravely. He set off immediately. Skarloey was scared, but determined. He rolled slowly up to the edge. The bridge creaked loudly. The river seemed deeper than ever. I must rescue my friend, whispered Skarloey. He chuffed slowly onto the bridge. The bridge groaned as he rolled forward. But Skarloey puffed on. And on. And finally, his driver coupled up and pulled Reneus to safety. Thank you, said Reneus. You have got to be brave to help me. Skarloey is no longer afraid of the bridge, and he loves his journeys more than ever. Rusty repairs the railway that winds through the mountains on the island of Sodor. The little diesel checks that the tracks, tunnels, and bridges are all in good working order. One day, Rusty was crossing the old wooden bridge. There was a big bump in the track. Rusty's driver stopped to check the bridge. There are cracks in the supports, he said. 
Ooh, that could be dangerous, cried Rusty. It might fall down if it's not repaired. And they hurried off to warn the other engines. The engines were waiting for their coal when Rusty arrived. Don't use the old wooden bridge, said Rusty. It's dangerous. How would you know, wished Duncan. You're only a diesel. And he puffed crossly away. He didn't even wait for his coal. Rusty hurried down the mountain to tell Sir Topham Hatt the bad news. Thank you, said Sir Topham Hatt. I'll send engineers to investigate the bridge. Meanwhile, nobody is to use it. Rusty's driver put up a sign, line closed. The engines had to travel a different way. Meanwhile, Duncan needed more coal to get home. But when he arrived at the coal bunker, it was empty. Bother, I won't get home without more coal. Where is the nearest bunker? On the other side of the old wooden bridge. But you can't cross. Rusty says it's not safe. Rusty always makes things sound worse than they are. I'm sure one trip across the old wooden bridge won't hurt, added his driver. When they got to the junction, Duncan's driver removed the sign and they set off towards the bridge. This was a big mistake. Suddenly, Duncan hissed to a halt. I'm out of steam. He had used up all his coal. What's that? He asked nervously. His driver looked out. The old wooden bridge was starting to collapse. Rusty, called Scarlowy. Duncan's gone across the bridge. I'd better check he's all right, the little diesel said. But the cracks in the supports were getting larger. A beam snapped. Timber pieces splashed into the water below. Help, whistled Duncan. I'm going to fall. But Rusty was on the way. Soon the little diesel reached the old wooden bridge. Duncan had never looked so scared. Rusty chuffed bravely onto the bridge. Careful, gasped Duncan. Soon they were coupled up. Hold on, said Rusty. Woo, shouted Duncan. The little diesel pulled him off the bridge, just in time. Don't use the old wooden bridge, said Rusty. It's dangerous. Sir Topham Hatt was cross with Duncan. That was very irresponsible. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. And Rusty, you were very brave. Oh, thanks. Yes, Rusty, you are a really useful engine. Thank you, sir. Rusty felt very reliable, too. Fergus is a small railway traction engine who works on the island of Sodor. One day, he was on his way to the quarry. He had a special job to do for Sir Topham Hatt. Hello, whistled Thomas. Where are you going? To the quarry, Fergus chuffed happily. Watch out for Bill and Ben, the twins, said Thomas. They love to make mischief. I won't let young rascals rattle me. You don't know the twins like I do, warned Thomas. Fergus arrived at the quarry. He went to work with Mavis and the twins. I'm afraid the freight cars are in a mess, said Mavis. Not to worry, we'll soon sort them out. Bill and Ben were delighted. Now we'll have some fun, whistled Ben. Yeah, we'll have the old boiler in a spin steam, Bill. Fergus liked helping Mavis, but he didn't like the way the twins were behaving one bit. 
Bill banged his freight cars hard. Some rocks fell onto the track. Do it right, Fergus ordered. Bill didn't like being ordered about by a traction engine. Don't interfere, he snapped back. Then Ben pushed his freight cars to block the line. Fergus was stuck. Out of my way, steamed Fergus. But Ben just grinned. The next day, the men were blasting rock. Wait for the all-clear signal, Fergus called to Bill and Ben. Do it right. There he goes again, puffed Bill. Do it right. From morning till night. Keep your funnel out of our quarry, huff Ben. The quarry master sent Bill and Ben to collect a rock crusher from the harbor. Fergus was left in peace with Mavis. The twins were still thinking about Fergus. He's just an old fusspot, said Bill. He's always saying, do it right. Well, the next thing he tells us to do, wished Bill, we'll do it wrong. <laughs> they laughed. Bill and Ben steamed back to the quarry. The rock crusher was heavy. It shook the rails as they went. The blasting has made that rock face unsafe, warned Fergus. Don't go near it. Do it right. But the twins took no notice of Fergus and were very naughty. As roughly as they could, they rattled the load towards the cliff. Look out, cried Fergus. And he rushed forward, and he bumped Bill and Ben out of the way. His driver jumped to safety as the rocks began to fall. But Fergus was covered in rocks right up to his funnel. It took a long time to dig him out. And no one worked harder to help than Bill and Ben. At last, Fergus was free. Bill and Ben were ashamed. We shouldn't have been so naughty, said Bill. We're very sorry, added Ben. Good, smiled Fergus. From now on, we can all do it right together. Oh, he was 
need it back urgently. Me? Really? Yes, you, you silly engine. Because he's the pride of the railway. So he huffed and he puffed, his wheels started turning. He chuffed and he chuffed, the little fire box burning. He slipped his brake and he was on his way. So, so, so.